Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of our Think Beginning Not End live series here on LinkedIn. And uh, as always, every Thursday we're going to be joined by none other than John Lees. Uh, we are up to episode two of an 11 episode series with John focused on all things business, sales, marketing, customer service and much, much more. I'll bring John into the broadcast really, really soon. He's joining us from California in the, in the United States. I um, hope you guys enjoyed last week's episode. And if you didn't see that, you can watch the replay on my YouTube channel. And uh, also the very first episode we did with John as well, which is customers will always be do always be, um, customers will do as they're told. So uh, make sure you go and check them out over on my, my YouTube channel. Uh, wherever you're tuning in, I want to thank everyone for tuning in on LinkedIn, uh, my YouTube channel, and also the Facebook page. Um, very, very um, grateful that you guys have chosen uh, 11 o'clock to tune in to John and I here today and for every other episode. Um, guys, just a couple of housekeeping things to start with. If you guys do see me looking this way, um, I am engaging you guys in the comment section over here. And um, I also will engage some of the comments on YouTube and Facebook from time to time. So when I bring John into the broadcast, I'll put myself up in the corner there. And it's not that I'm not listening to John. I just want to make sure that if any of you guys have got any questions, um, I can get them uh, over to John as we're chatting. I also occasionally interrupt John just to acknowledge you guys that have joined us on the broadcast. So really, really excited about today's episode. Um, for those of you that don't know John, um, he's an author of 13 books. Here's all the covers here, and I'll let John tell you about some of those books a little bit later on. I was first introduced to John listening to these cassette tapes a long, long time ago. Um, so real honour and privilege that John's uh, agreed to come on this show every week. And like always, this is for you guys out there. And uh, I get to learn along with you by having a great guest on like John and, and listening to the things that um, he's going to teach us all over these uh, 11 episodes. So we're into episode number two. Technically, it's probably episode number three, given our first episode we did with John at the very start of the LinkedIn Live series. So I'm going to bring John into the broadcast. And don't forget, guys, if you've got any questions, please make sure that... Um, that you guys um, get the questions over to John and I during the broadcast. I'm just bringing John into it right now, and uh, hopefully you guys will see John very, very soon. Just getting this right. Sorry, guys, I've always uh, have a small delay as we do this. And uh, just get this right here. And, uh, John, I'll let you know as soon as you're in. John's sitting in the green room at the moment just waiting for me to fumble my way through this. Um, and here we are. I've got a side-by-side. So... Without further ado, guys, I want to bring uh, John into the broadcast. Um, thank you again, John, for joining us today um, for episode number two. We're covering the topic, Beware the Lean Business. So I'm really intrigued to see where this one's going to go. But just quickly for everyone out there, um, just a short introduction again for yourself, John, for those who haven't met you before, um, take it away. Sorry, guys. I think I may have a little audio issue here. John, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Just working through. Ah, yes. Over to you, John. I just asked if you could give us a quick introduction for those of our viewers who haven't met you before. And if they haven't watched the other um, couple of episodes that we've done, I highly recommend they go and watch them. But for those who haven't met you before, John, just a, a short introduction on yourself before we get into today, to today's okay. episode, Beware the Lies in Business. Okay, well, thanks again, Simon, for uh, thinking of this concept and uh, making it happen. I very much appreciate it, and I hope people do enjoy it. Um, so you know, without going into a lot of detail, in my background, uh, I um, started off in Australia, a 25-year-old. Doesn't seem like 10 years ago, but anyway. Um, no, I was only 25 when I became a sales manager for a company called Record & Coleman, now called Record Ben Kaiser. Started to learn about how to manage and help a sales force to be successful. And uh, then I was eventually, uh, just a couple of years later, made marketing and sales director for a company called Schwarzkopf. And um, if you know Schwarzkopf, you will know that it's a hair care company. And knowing that and seeing me, I do feel I owe you an explanation um, because I could sense what you were I thinking. I think we have the same problem. Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you're probably saying, well, how is it possible for him to have worked for a hair care company? Well, thank you very much. 
Well, for your information, I had to test opposition product. <laughs> That's what happened in my case. And people say strange things to you when you have this condition. John, do you realize you're losing your hair? Which suggests perhaps that if I had been more responsible, I might have kept it. John, uh, when did you first notice you were losing your hair? Well, it was taking me longer to wash my face. So all the nonsense that goes on, and these days, I hope you don't say anything to anyone, these days, I use L'Oreal. <laughs> why? Because I'm worth it, that's why. So you probably have some questions that you want to ask <laughs> from the very start. The first question is, are you drinking scotch? Um, no, I'm not. Okay? I'm drinking brandy. Uh, and don't worry, because I always know when I've had enough. Because I collapse. Um, you might also be thinking, are you able to come up with ideas? Are you able to come up with strategies on the spot? <clears throat> I think so, yeah. Uh, for instance, today I was reading that the average age of a woman, generally speaking, in most modern societies is about 86, whereas the average age of a man is about uh, 78. When I read that, I gave it some thought and I made a decision. If I make it to 78, I'm getting a sex change. So that gives you an idea of the kind of thinking that's going on up here. And the other uh, question you might have is, are you literally, you know, on the spot in a difficult situation? Are you able to come up with ideas? Yes, I am. Let me give you an example. My wife and I have three children. They're all girls, except for two. And um, the first two were born at Manly Hospital in Sydney. And I remember the very first birth, um, my wife and I were uh, driving towards Manly Hospital and her water broke on the way. And she panicked somewhat, as you can imagine. And uh, she said, oh, no, we're never going to make it now. And this is where my thinking came in. I said, of course we are. Don't be silly. Just drive faster. So you see, that that will sort of give you an idea of, you know, the way I think and how helpful I can be to people. Anyway, let's get started. So we're going to talk about lies in business today, and there's quite a few of them. I've got 25 that I've listed, so I don't know if we're going to make it through all of them, but um, the, these lies are basically impediments, um, and they've been going on for a long time, by the way, and I don't mean that anybody intended for them to be lies, but the point is they are. They're misleading. They're very misleading. Um, so I'm going to go through them. I'll, I'll spend just a, a minute or two on each one as quickly as I can. Maybe maybe one or two will take a little bit more time, but I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of your time situation, so I'll do it as quickly as I can. The first lie, um, the first misconception, if you like. I get asked a lot. I have been for many years. John, and this, this is asked in a serious way, by the way. John? Yes. Do you think salespeople are born? I said, well, I think it helps. I mean, if we can't see you or hear you, it's going to be very difficult for you to make a sale. So, you know, the point about salespeople being born is absolute nonsense. Parents sell to their children, apart from telling them about things, they sell to their children. Teachers are supposed to sell to their pupils and so forth. Doctors are supposed to sell to their customers, their patients in a particular way. Um, and the point is that selling means positive influence. That's all it means. If you've got a friend and they want to tell you about a book they've just read, that's selling. If they want to tell you about a film they've seen, that's selling. They don't ask permission to do it. They want to tell you. Selling is supposed to be one person helping another and so forth. So that's the first lie. Get that one out of the way. Salespeople are not born. We're all salespeople, whether we like it or not. <clears throat> Second... Uh, this is a very uh, problematic lie, and that lie is the purpose of business is to make money. Uh, well, it isn't. That's the per Making money is extremely important for any business, but it's a commercial goal. It's the background of the business, not the foreground of the business. The foreground of the business, the purpose of the business, is in four parts. Number one, find good customers. Number two, serve the customers very well. Number three, satisfy the customers. Don't just pacify them, satisfy them. Help get better results for them. And number four, keep the customers. <clears throat> okay, very, very important. And I'll touch on that a little later again. But that's the purpose of business. <clears throat> All right, and we have to have a mentality in business, which is 
them, which is the market, and us, not us and them. Most businesses, again, they don't mean to do this, have a mentality, they're not aware of it, which is us and them. So most everything they think about is us and our results, the way we do things, and they don't really therefore understand the customers and what their requirements are and so forth. So forget about the purpose of business making money. The purpose of business is to do with helping customers to be successful because if you don't do that, then you're not going to make money. It's about as simple as that. Don't blame me. I didn't make the rules. Okay, next. Uh, successful mm -hmm. people. Yes, yeah, sorry, you can ask a question. Yeah, uh, just to jump in there quickly, John, um, that one really resonates with me personally because many years ago, uh, working on a building site in Sydney, an old Italian uh, tradesman once said to me, um, if you do the job properly, the money takes care of itself. If you do the job properly and look after the customer, the money will take care of itself. And um, it's kind of reflective just in that, in that um, you know, the statement that you've just made. So, um, yeah, I just thought I wanted to share that with everyone. Um, and just really... Talking of building sites, I was on a building um, Sorry, and just... Sorry. No, you're right. And just really quickly, I'll, I'll cross back to you, John. I'll just quickly acknowledge... Um, a few of the people that are, that have jumped on to watch us here very quickly on on LinkedIn. I'm just bringing up the feed quickly. So just a very quick hello to Samantha Cross, um, uh, Carol, and Josh. And uh, if I've missed anyone else, guys, just drop a comment in there, and um, I'll thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, if you've got any questions, please make sure you get them across. But I'm going to go back to John. I'll try not to cut in too much. Um, so, yeah, apologies for cutting in then, John, but it was just something that resonated quite strongly with myself. No problem. So, um, successful people have less problems than other people. A lie. That's a lie. Successful people have more problems than anyone else. Why? Because they go looking for the problems. That's why. It's not because they're negative. It's because they want to know what the problems are. Do we have problems with our staff? Do we have problems in the way we serve customers? Do we have problems in the way that we help customers to be successful with our products or service? And so they go looking for those problems. Okay, in the same way that if you take Mr. A and Mr. B, Mr. A regularly goes for a health check. Mr. B chooses not to question who's going to find the most problems. Mr. A. Second question, who's in control mm -hmm. of his health? Mr. A. So, you know, don't start thinking that successful people have less problems. They have more problems because they go looking for them and they can um, make sure that they make them work the way they want to do. Successful people, here's another lie, successful people like make less mistakes than anyone else. A lie, again. Can you imagine in laboratories how many mistakes they make on the way to coming up with the right kind of medicine and so forth, which is what's going on now mm. with COVID-19 and so forth? All over the world, people are striving to come up with um, some form of vaccine that will be of help to everyone. And, you know, they're not going to do that first time around. If they did, well, that would be wonderful. But they make a lot of mistakes. The only way to get anything right is to get it wrong on the way to getting it right. Okay? And for the most part, business people do these things in the background. They make the mistakes in the background. They test it with customers and so forth. For instance, I love telling jokes. I love, you know, one-liners, jokes, whatever it happens to be. And I test them on you know, the people at Starbucks that I serve, uh, so, <laughs> that serve me, uh, I, I test them on neighbors, I test them on friends, and so forth, because I want to know what effect the joke is having on someone so that I can change it accordingly. So don't go thinking that successful people don't make mistakes. They make more mistakes than anyone. Successful people are more positive. Another lie. That's just a lie. Okay, you go around acting positive, you're going to get jailed. Okay, the, the point is that successful people are accountable. That's what they are. They're accountable. If you are accountable for what you do and for what you achieve, you don't have any choice except to be positive. The choice has been removed from your life. Okay, so don't forget, <clears throat> be accountable, and then that will lead you to being positive, which is better than acting positive. Here's a very important one for anyone in business. Knowledge is... Power. Don't tell me you haven't heard that. We've been mm. here for years and years and years and years, and it is a lie. Again, it wasn't an intention lie. I understand what they mean, but it's a lie. Knowledge does not belong to you. It belongs to your customers. 
Okay? That's who it belongs to. Not you. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is uh, something that belongs to the customer. So then three, if you believe that, then three factors come into mind. Number one, what kind of knowledge will I give people? I can't give them, simply give them knowledge of our company and our products. I mean, they, they would bore them the pants off them. We need to give them ideas on how to be productive with our products or service, how to be successful. So, for instance, in the last session that we had, which uh, centered around this book here, Sell Pleasure First, Price Last, and Sell Products Last, uh, people are only interested in their own products. They're not interested in our products, okay, or services. They're interested in their products and their services. What they want to know is how can I be successful? And to be honest with you, most salespeople, uh, based on the fact that they get very little service from their own management, do not know how to sell success. What they sell is access. They sell access to products. Well, let me give you some news. The market has complete access to products. What they need is success ideas, and they need help to make them happen. So this book, by the way, is still available for you in PDF form, free of charge. So you can contact me or you can contact uh, Simon, and I'm more than happy to send you a copy of this, which, again, because it's in PDF form, you can send it on to your customers, you can send it on to your staff, and so forth. So let me know if you want a copy of that. My email address is info, I-N-F-O, at John Lees, J-O-H-N-L-E-E-S, info at johnlees.com.au. Okay? So um, let me show you what I mean by the knowledge factor. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't finish what I was saying. I beg your pardon. So, so when you agree that knowledge is not power, giving knowledge is power, then three things come to mind. The first thing is, <clears throat> um, what quality of knowledge will I give? You can only give knowledge to the market that they appreciate that is all about how to make them help them to be more successful with your product or with your service. Number two, how will I give the knowledge? Okay, so we have to learn to communicate. We have to learn how to communicate with our customers without asking permission to do so and so forth. We have to learn to navigate and be better communicators. And the third factor is how will I gain new knowledge, more new knowledge, because I can't keep going around talking to people about the same knowledge. So let me give you just a, a quick visual portrait of all this. So here is your... And as John's just uh, quickly drawn up that portrait, um, uh, the, the picture to go with what he's about to, to talk about, guys, please just remember, I've got the comments feed live over here, so I can uh, interact with you guys. If you've got any questions, uh, get them in, because I can get them across to John. Uh, John, we've had some great uh, great comments already, and I'll share them with you in a second. Um, I don't want to hold you up, but uh, yeah, just let everyone know that we've got the live comments feed here from LinkedIn. And I'm just on the YouTube channel right now, checking some of those comments and Facebook as well. So if you've got questions, uh, get them in, and uh, John and I will be happy to answer any of them as we go. Sorry, John, back over to you. Were the comments about me being good looking or things like that? <laughs> trying to focus yeah, on they the were. Um, Sick of it. Yeah, many comments like that. It should go without saying. Okay. So here's your knowledge, okay? And obviously, when a person starts, they have very little knowledge, and then hopefully the company builds up the knowledge. Be careful what knowledge you build up, okay? Don't just build up uh, knowledge about who you are and what you do and how long you've been in business and, you know, all about your products. They're not interested in that, okay? They're not disinterested. They're not disrespectful. They want to know what's in it for me. What can you do for me? What can you help our business with? Because most suppliers, you're sitting on a gold mine, most suppliers that call on the marketplace simply sell access to products. They don't sell success. So last week we covered the idea, which is in this book called the success search, where you find your most successful customers who, who gain success with your product, with or without your help. Okay, and then we undo it. We, we unravel the, the success story, and that then becomes our story that we take to the market. That is our knowledge that we take to the market. And then we have the customer or the prospect. And if you're lucky, if you're lucky, if they call you, the knowledge level will be up to here. Hi, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? 
and so forth and so on. And we have to be able to say, yes, of course we can. Of course we can. But then you go higher and you begin to give higher levels of knowledge. Okay? This is very important and that's why knowledge is not power. Giving knowledge is power. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next. Learn how to handle objections. So we're getting into some of the sales-related areas now. So you, don't tell me you haven't heard that, please. Learn how to handle objections. Again, it's nonsense. It's a lie. It's very misleading. Okay, our job is not to handle objections. Our job is to anticipate objections. How many customers do you have to talk to before you realize what they're concerned about and worried about? We can't wait until they open their mouth and say something negative. You know, well, what about this or what about that? And then you go, oh, okay, well, yeah, I mean, you know, and then you fight back. That's not the idea. The idea is to be able to say something like, by the way, I talk to a lot of people who are in your type of role, and one of the concerns they have is, and then you mention it before they do. And then say, there's no need to worry about it because, mm -hmm. and then you explain how you can turn it into a positive. So don't learn to handle objections. Don't wait for them. Learn how to anticipate the objections, okay, from all the customers you've dealt with, and then you mention them first. <clears throat> Another one is uh, features and benefits. Now, you've surely heard that. Features and benefits, very important. Um, it's nonsense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I had that experience on the weekend, John, and uh, I, I was out looking at some motor cars, actually, and uh, – some of the points you're saying today are very, very relevant. And uh, features and benefits is definitely one that stuck with me from the weekend. Well, yeah, I mean, um, everybody's guilty of it. Or most people are guilty of it anyway. Um, let me just put it in perspective for you. Features are the detail. Or if you like, if you were trying to influence someone to uh, have a particular dish, a particular meal, um, what would you give them? So that they have satisfaction, would it be the would it be the uh, recipe or would it be the taste? Give them a taste. If you give them a taste, they will say, "Fine, that's great. I love it." If they if they do like it, they're not interested in the details of the recipe. That's up to the chef. Okay, they they, they can get the details of the of the uh, of the recipe or the, if you like the features, but mostly they're interested in the benefits. That's what they're interested in. So just mm -hmm. revert around benefits and features. Make the mention of the benefit and then explain how the benefit is achieved. Don't do it the other way around. <clears throat> close the sale. Again, you've heard that one. You must close the sale. Uh, well, we don't. The job of a salesperson is not to close the sale. The job of a salesperson is to help the customer to close the sale, okay, to make a decision. Okay, that's our job. Um, you ever been to a doctor who said, okay, we found the problem, we know what caused it, and we know what will happen if it goes untreated. So, what do you want to do? You want some tablets? You want to go to the hospital? What do you want to do? They don't do that. They come straight out with their recommendation, and that's what we have to do. We have to be able to say something like, I'm looking forward to what your decision will be, and I thought it would be helpful for you if I give you my recommendations as to what I think would work best for you. That's what they're looking for. We can't be guilty of saying things like at the end of the discussion, so what do you think? And that leaves them right up in the air. Okay, all the wind has gone out of their spells. So I hope you're taking notes of these things. And by the way, I discussed with uh, Simon uh, before we started, I've got a list of all the lies here. Okay, there's 25 of them, so we'll see whether we get through them or not. And uh, I can send you this, obviously, by email. So can Simon. Simon. So, um, and then you can make notes and contact me anytime, by the way, by email. And so, John, I, I've got that uh, uh, page of the the... Of the um, the lies and what have you, and I'm looking at number five or number eight or whatever it happens to be, could you please elaborate on that for me? More than happy to do it. More than happy to do it. It's only $500. It's nothing. Deposit. It's a $500 deposit, I mean. Now, I'm serious. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, as a result of Simon having made all this happen, we're happy to help you in any way that we can. So let's go now to the next point, um, upselling. Again, you will have heard that phrase. Can you imagine how customers would feel if they heard that expression? Upselling. <clears throat> uh, it doesn't work. It never has worked. Customers can see it coming a mile away. What we should talk to our staff about is up-serving. 
that's what we should talk to them about. Teach them good service, okay, which is being reactive, okay, helping a person with what they ask for, okay. Upserving is helping them with what you think they need, okay. So that's very important that we understand the difference between the two. So uh, <clears throat> we're not upselling, we're upserving. Don't get involved in sales techniques. They don't work. They never have worked. They drive customers mad and so forth. Another one that is used mainly by management is we must change. We've got to change. <clears throat> well, the news is you don't have to change because change threatens the staff uh, to um, adjust what they've been working on and got comfortable with. So what we have to sell is not change, but progress. Okay. And by the way, you can't have progress without change. Progress is the goal, the improvement, and change is the strategy. Okay. But if you put the emphasis on change, you're threatening people. Okay. They don't want to change, but they do want to get better. And that's what we're selling them on. <clears throat> In the same way that we can't go to a prospect and say, have you ever thought about changing suppliers? It's crazy. Keep, you would never get away with it. <clears throat> time management is another lie. So you've heard that one. Time management. We must learn to manage time. Well, you can't. Time is a preset factor in the universe. It's the same today as it was 200 years ago. The job is self-management, not time management. So we have to teach staff how to manage themselves. So, for instance, when I first started as a sales manager with Record and Coleman, I knew nothing about management except for the way I had been treated as, uh, as, a, as a salesperson in the UK um, by different managers, most of whom were hopeless. Nice guys, but hopeless. Uh, so um, what we have to understand is that um, <clears throat> we have to help our staff to become, our sales staff to become self-managers. So what happened to me is I get to be sales manager, and every night I rang the salespeople uh, politely and so forth, and I said, hi, it's John Lees, how are you doing? Yeah, good, John, how can I help you? Yeah, just checking to see how you're doing for the week and for the month. Uh, what do you mean? What, with your sales? Oh, yeah, no, look, John, I've been very busy. I really, I honestly don't know at the moment. Okay, well, just when you've done, uh, when you've got a chance, uh, uh, please look at it and uh, just get, get back to me and let me know what the figures are and we'll go from there. Well, why do you want to know? I want to know so that I can help you if you need help or I can learn from you if you get an extra special result. <sighs> okay, I could see that they were delighted. Then I'd ring up as another salesperson, say exactly the same thing. Hi, just checking to see how you're going. Uh, well, why do you want to know? So that I can help you or you can help me, one or the other. <clears throat> well, I'm just about to have my dinner. You will have your dinner, then ring me. <sighs> then I'd ring someone else. Hi, uh, Matthew, it's John here, John Lewis. Uh, just checking to see how you're going for the week and the month. Why? What do you want to know for? So that I can help you if you need any help. Well, we're going out tonight. Well, then go out tonight and then ring me tomorrow. Every single night I rang every salesperson and I could tell they loved me. I could just, I don't know what it is, like just something about me I can tell. <laughs> and they, they hated the whole thing. But within a month, within a month, they were ringing me every night to let me know exactly where they were up to. Mm. Why? Why did they ring me every night? Because they had become more serious about the business. Crap. It wasn't that. It was that they wanted their dinner in peace. Okay, I, you know, not about to fool me with that one. Okay, the point is they need to know, I need to know. The worst thing that could happen is to get to the end of a week or an end of a month and then find out too late that we missed out. Okay, so very important. We must keep customers. Yeah, well, I agree with that one. Okay, but just thinking about keeping them isn't going to work. If you want to keep a customer, then keep developing that customer. Keep getting better results for them become invaluable to them. And when you become invaluable to them, you will keep them. But there's no other way to keep a customer, uh, you know, by hoping that they will stay with you or hoping that other companies will not make an approach to them and so forth. So remember, keeping customers, just work out the word keep and replace it with the word develop. Keep on developing your customers and helping them to achieve a better result. <clears throat> Another item you will have heard, Another lie, the customer is always right. Really? About what? What are they right about? 
The only thing that a customer is right about is how they wish to be treated during the uh, selling process. Okay, so uh, if, we, <laughs> if we mess that up, we haven't got a chance. If we say we're going to see someone at 10 o'clock and we turn up at 20 past 10, we're in big trouble. Okay, that is a sign that you are completely disorganized. Okay, and they, you know, they may not say anything to you. Why would they? Who needs an argument? Okay, but that, that gets lodged in here and they say, this guy is not trustworthy. This lady is not trustworthy. What happens to be the case? Okay, so very, very important that we understand that the customer is right about wanting better service and service is the basis upon which you go to the next level, which is selling. So I mentioned in last week's episode, which by the way, Simon organized to get uh, copies like YouTube type links, yes? Hello? Yep, got YouTube links, John. For anyone that wants to watch them, um, most of them are up there in my profile on LinkedIn. So you can click on any of them. Um, they're also, um, now those, those links that are up in my profile are sitting on my YouTube channel. And uh, you can also go across to the Facebook page and watch any of these as well. But the easiest way to go and watch the replays is certainly just jump to my profile and go and re-watch them uh, on YouTube, John. So, um, yeah, that's definitely the easiest way for everyone to go and check them out again. Okay. So let's say for instance, I was calling on a prospect. Okay. I haven't met the prospect before. They are uh, regrettably programmed to think that most reps will bore the pants off them. That's not the rep's fault, that's management's fault. Staff dance to the tune of management, but it happens all the time. Hi, I'm so-and-so, and, -so and uh, we make, we do, uh, we started in 1992. You know, all this sort of stuff. People are not interested in that at all. Just give them your business card, show them that you're involved in a business. And the service part starts with, I assume from the outset that you've already got at least one supplier when it comes to this kind of product or service. Is that correct? Yes. And I assume also that they do a good job for you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, fine. Sometimes they'll say, no, actually, they don't. Okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, I'm not here to interfere with anything that you're currently doing with current suppliers. What I want to talk to you about is how to get better results with this kind of product because we have lots of information about this, which I think you'll find very valuable. So you've now you've made it clear that you're not getting involved in a fight, an argument, just simply being an alternative distributor, you are positioned as a contributor. And that's absolutely vital. Most companies are distributors of products, whether they like it or not, or services. We are, must learn to become contributors, which means that ideas, ideas make money. Okay. Mm. Work smarter, not harder. Again, that's just absolute nonsense. Um, if you, if, if you find that a medical laboratory has suddenly come up with uh, a medication, a vaccine, something that's going to help people, have a guess how much harder they'll work after that, making it all happen, getting it to the point of distribution and contribution and so forth and so on. So, you know, the, this idea of working smarter, not harder, you know, the whole idea of working smarter is so that we can work harder, that we can put our work to good use. Another one is, uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Again, can you imagine organizations that have made history by progressing their product or service and always making it better? You know, we've got to make sure, we've got to make sure that it's broken in one way or another. Okay, how can we improve it? We're not saying it's no good. We're not saying it doesn't work. We're saying, how can it work better? Because the last thing we want is someone else coming into the market and going a step ahead of us. Okay. Very important. Let me show you what I mean. <clears throat> so here's the uh, here's the market. Okay, and um, here's uh, company A, company B, company C, company D, etc. This is in a particular product category. Then you've got other product categories, and so forth and so on. So how does company A <clears throat> get to improve its business? Well, company A knows what to do. It must make an attack on B, while B is trying to attack C. So A will then attack B, B will attack C, C will attack D, and eventually B will say, oh, I see, you, you want to attack me, do you? Right, well, you, you. And then they start attacking A, 
and C attacks B, and this is how business goes on. All the businesses are attacking each other and so forth and so on. The best businesses obviously have to defend their situation in the market and get a better share. But really, the best, the best in the marketplace learn how to enlarge the market. That's their job. Okay, And when they do that, people will listen to them because then they're selling success, not just access. They're selling contribution, not simply distribution. Okay, um, another one, act enthusiastic and you will become enthusiastic. Well, that's absolute hogwash. Imagine walking around trying to be enthusiastic. You know, you could be arrested, okay? Enthusiasm is supposed to be a natural thing. So uh, act enthusiastic when you've got something to be enthusiastic about. The economy is making things very tough for us right now, and that does happen from time to time. It will happen right now because of all the problems that retailers and other businesses have had and airlines and everybody else that's suffering enormously in the marketplace. And people will say, uh, you know, the economy is very difficult at the moment. You know, we've got to lay low and wait until all this is over. Like as if, you know, you should be aware of the economy. You should be aware of the outside circumstances and so forth, the outside conditions. Um, but the point is that we have a second economy, and the second economy is inside the business. The first economy is outside the business, about which you can do nothing except pull your horns in or, you know, make hay while the sun shines. But you, the second economy is inside the business. Could you possibly deal with more customers? Of course. So then we have to learn how to convert prospects into customers, which is what our last session was all about last week. Um, <clears throat> Can we, uh, can we do more for the customers we've got? Of course we can. And that's really what our mission should be, is helping them to get better results at all times. Is it possible for our staff, mm -hmm. service staff, sales staff, etc., to get better than they are today? Of course they can. Of course they can. And that should be our internal drive, is to help them to get better at all times. We always be aiming education and motivation at them. I'm not talking about motivational speakers, because they drive me nuts, as I've said before. I'm talking about realistic growth and so forth. And um, yes, so very important for us to understand that um, ultimately our job is uh, to realize that we've got a second economy. Management can also get better. And when the internal things start to get better and we start working on the second economy, then we are in control of the business and we're not a victim. Okay, stress, be careful of stress, stress can break you. Really. Okay, let's, uh, let's have a look at that one. Because people get worried about stress. So here's a, uh, here's a footballer and he's coming off the field and he's got a gash here and a cut here. But interestingly, he's also got a smile here. Why? Because this is what he wants to do. This is what he loves to do. Can you imagine someone playing in a game of football, tennis, or any other kind of sport when, in fact, they don't want to be there? Okay, so there's two forms of stress. One form of stress is negative. It's called distress. Based on the uh, this word here, original from Latin, uh, like uh, disaster, uh, dilemma, and so forth and so on. Um, this is negative stress. Don't allow yourself to get involved in distress. It, it can, I mean, occasionally it may happen to you and handle it as well as you can, but the whole idea is to get the team involved in having positive stress. The positive stress is known. You will very, very rarely see the word, you stress, as in euphoric, okay? Uh, positive stress. And that's what people go through when I was describing, say, for instance, a footballer on the field. They love it. They want to, This is what they want to do. They enjoy what they do. They don't endure it. If you have staff who are enduring their job, you're in big trouble. <clears throat> so stress is a natural thing, absolutely natural. It helps to build people and so forth, but make sure it's the positive kind. Be aware of your priorities, okay? You must have a to-do list. Know what you're going to do. Well, I have no argument with that. I have a to-do list. 
you know, every day, whenever. Um, but I've also had to learn how to be mindful of uh, items that can invade my time and, and focus. Okay, so we have, first, first of all, priorities. Okay, built on the word prior. Jobs to be done prior to all others. <clears throat> Absolutely obvious in one sense. But then there's another word. Again, this word I discovered many, many years ago. Post the priorities. Not a word you're going to hear, but it's built on the word post. Jobs to be done after all others. Be aware of other jobs. People come to you and say, oh, uh, Simon, I, I was just wondering if you could help me with this uh, job, that I, this problem that I've got at the moment. And then as they tell you what it is, and you, because you're a nice person, you want to help them and say, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll help you. And as you do that, you move away from here into this area here. Now, I'm not suggesting you be rude to people and say, get lost, I'm busy. I say, yeah, no, no, I'd be happy to help you. Uh, how about Thursday, Thursday afternoon? How's that? Oh, no. well, no, 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 I was, I was hoping maybe you could help me now. No, I can't help you at the moment because I've got some other things that I've just got to do, okay? But I'm more than happy to help you on Thursday. Now, quite often, they'll solve the problem on their own, okay? Or they'll wait until Thursday. But either way, we can't allow ourselves to kill these by not knowing what these are. They're someone else's priorities, okay? And we're not, we don't be rude about it. Just simply acknowledge that they have them. But if you're not careful, it will get involved in these things here. Can you imagine a doctor being interrupted during the middle of an operation? Of course not. You know, they're focused on their priorities, and that's what business people should be too. So we're getting to the end of it now. Really, relevant, uh, really, really uh, those last two points are very relevant, John, particularly in the in the economic climate that we're in now. Um, you know, around stress and priorities, and 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 you know, certainly making sure that someone else's priorities uh, don't cloud your own. Um, I've definitely experienced that myself at times, no doubt about that. And um, yeah, and then obviously, you know, you end up piling more more work on yourself and then it relates back to stress and then the things that were your own priorities yeah. get, get pushed to the side. Yeah. It's very, very relevant, you know, right now for everyone to understand how those two in particular are very... You, you, uh, begin, you begin to fail. That's really what happens. You begin to fail. And you can blame yeah. it on everything you like, but go and look in the mirror and that's where the answer is. And we, as I said, don't be rude to me, yeah. but just simply explain to them that I've got some priorities I've got to work on right now. How about Thursday? How about tomorrow afternoon? Whatever the case may be, but don't allow yourself to get drawn into someone else's priorities because it will ruin yours. All righty. Um, here's a couple um, to finish things off. You may have heard this. I don't know to what extent you may have heard it. Whispered behind the scenes in the company, I just wish our customers were more dynamic. I wish they were better at what they did. I wish they were more successful. Because let's face it, our company is dependent on them growing and developing and so forth. Okay? And if they don't, then what should we do? Help them? No. Let's just criticize them. Let's criticize them and let's hope that in some way, shape or form, that not in front of them, of course, we wouldn't dare to do that. But we can do it back in the company. So I'll give you an example. Many, many years ago, while working for Swatskov, uh, I was going to Perth and a guy sat next to me, the talkative type. And he said, uh, G'day, mate. Uh, who are you with? And I told him, I I'm with Swatskov. You're kidding. No. You're kidding. No, 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 I'm with Swasco. He said, well, I'm with, and then he mentioned a competitive company. So now I have to spend four or five hours sitting next to a competitor. And this is what he said to me. These are the exact words as I recall them. Yeah, uh, what a bunch of idiots hairdressers, because hairdressers salons were our main area of sales and profit and so forth. What a bunch of idiots hairdressers are, aren't they? I said, what, what, what do you mean? 
He said, well, they're the worst business people I've ever met. They're hopeless at marketing, hopeless at management, hopeless at sales, hopeless at service, hopeless at hiring people. They're the worst business people I've ever met. And for as long as it took him to tell me that, I then realized why, for the first time, why we had it all over his company. Because we didn't think of our customers like that. We knew that our customers had deficiencies. Okay? Every business does. Every individual does. And they're either working on it or they're not. <clears throat> but they also had efficiencies. They worked very hard. They were artistically inclined people. They loved their work. Okay? But they needed help to run their business. So have a guess who helped them. Schwarzkopf did. Okay? We had meetings with customers. We actually formalized it. We met with the customers a few times. These were salon owners. Some were running quite large organizations, others running smaller organizations. But these were progressive people. And um, we would meet with them every quarter. Eventually, I formalized it and called it the board of customers. And they loved the meetings more than we did, by the way, because they could talk to each other. And we met with them for a day and a half at a time. And this happened uh, three or four times a year in Australia and in New Zealand. And uh, not only did they give us feedback as required on our salespeople, our service, and so forth and so on, but they also revealed unknowingly that they needed a lot of help in running their business more successfully. Because if they don't run their business more successfully, we're in trouble. So we began to set up a separate part of the company, which I developed, and eventually I, I resigned my post as marketing and sales director to work on this other area of business, which worked exceedingly well over, you know, I mean, it took us a while, you know, but the point is we became market leader, uh, great companies like L'Oreal and Weller, fabulous companies, international companies, uh, became second and third. Because what they did was sell products very nicely. They thought well of their customers, generally speaking, I hope. Uh, but they did not provide them with any help that they really needed but never asked for. So that's one of the priorities of any good business is to understand what are the needs of our customers. They know what they want, but they don't always know what they need. We're the same when we go to the doctor. We know what we want. We've got a problem and we want it fixed, but we don't know what the need is. We don't know how it happened or how it can be fixed. Okay, so we've got to help our customers to be successful. There's nothing to do with posturing or arrogance. It's to do with fact, the fact that we're in the same boat, so to speak. We're in the same business. We're in the same market, and we've got to help them. So that's what we did, and we kept on making it better. And maybe at one of these episodes, I'll show you, because I've kept it all, all the things that we did. I wrote an article every couple of weeks for our customers, a little bit of fun involved, but mostly it was aimed at various things that they had to learn how to do better. We had meetings with them. We even had a sales conference every year, not only with our salespeople, but also with our customers. And we made it easier for them to get there by, you know, organizing the cost to be cheaper for them. We didn't pay for any of this, by the way. Um, so they would come to conferences. We would have people like Stefan from, from, from Brisbane, the largest salon owner in Australia. He came along and gave them insights into how he ran his business and so forth and so on, and other people too. And um, they absolutely loved it. No one else gave them any help. No one. So what, that's why we had market leadership. Our products were about the same as everybody else's, okay? But we sell productivity, not product. And I remember, you know, after I had left Swanscoff, I met a guy one day. Uh, we were playing tennis, and he was working for a company called Goldwell. And Goldwell had just asked me to come in and consult for them, which I was happy to do. And he said to me, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I remember going to see a Swatchcoff customer one day, and I told them that we had a special deal on our coloring products. And the lady said, that is a great deal, I really must say. But unfortunately, she said, I can't leave Swatchcoff. They're too valuable to me. I don't want to cut off the relationship that I have with Swatchcoff. And then she showed this rep from Goldwell all the things that she had given to her or sold to her at no, at no profit to us in order to help her run her business. And the guy was, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? There was nothing he could do because he didn't have any weapon that would help in that fight. Okay, so don't knock your customers, help your customers. And um, 
Yeah, so that's about it. Uh, the other one I was going to mention is we must strive um, to succeed, and uh, that's obvious, but we must also strive to create success and sell success. So, Simon, that's it. Don't forget, everyone, we've got this copy here. Um, if you've made notes, you can associate them with these points here, or you can just uh, call me or you can uh, on FaceTime or something, doesn't cost anything as I understand it, uh, call me, use Skype, whatever you like, uh, email, and I, and I will answer any questions that you've got regarding any of these points here. And as I said, if you would like, um, you know, a copy of this book in PDF form, which you can then send it off to other people and so forth, uh, let me know. Sell pleasure first, price last. This is in its 10th printing, by the way. Um, the reason for that is the first nine were smudged, which was unfortunate. But anyway, so um, yes, and there are other books we can talk about at other times, Successful Sales Management, uh, The Focus Thoughts and Actions of High Achievers. These can all be available to you in, um, in the PDF format. And uh, yeah, and um, Simon's got them there. Helping the best get better, which is one idea to a page aimed at management. So thank you again. And um, i just like to thank finish. You. Can I just finish with a simple statement? Uh, Absolutely, thing, John. Go for it. Okay. One thing I want to say about myself. Okay. I've talked about customers. I've talked about organizations. There's one thing I'd like to say about me. And that is that I will never, ever allow success to change me in any way. And I was explaining this the other day to the guy who I pay to clean my shoelaces. So now you've got an idea of where I stand. <laughs> John, thank you so much again uh, for today's episode. Um, you know, we're back next week with episode three. And, um, I'll, I'll, you know, um, just... Thank you on behalf of the audience. Um, a lot of people tuning in via LinkedIn Live, um, a couple of people watching, obviously, across uh, YouTube and Facebook. And, guys, I will get into those comments after. But thank you so much for tuning in. Just to wrap it up again, guys, um, John is making his books available to you for free, right? So John is the author of 13 books here, and the ones that he's offered you today, I'll just show you this because um, there you go, 13 books John's written. As at the start, I started listening to John way back when cassette tapes were very cool. Um, all you got to do is email John, info at johnlees.com.au. And John's also made himself available to our audience audience to ans answer any questions that you guys have got. Maybe you've got an idea. Maybe you've got a problem with your sale team. Um, you know, a lot of those answers are actually in the content that we're putting out in live, which you can go and watch any of these episodes on replay on the YouTube channel. But also a lot of the answers are in those books and John's willing to help you guys as well. So, again, thank you so much for today's episode, guys. We are back next Thursday at 11 a.m. Sydney time, 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time for my friends in the U.S. And we've got a few that are watching there uh, from Florida in particular. So thanks for tuning in from there, guys. And then um, uh, for my friends in the U.K., um, I know Carol is always up, up uh, at... at ungodly hours to watch our show and um, we will probably maybe john maybe we can try and run an episode um as a bit of a recap for everyone in the uk at a more times at a time suitable for them but um guys we are back every thursday and uh, we'll be up to episode um episode four next thursday um and just remember guys you can go across the youtube channel watch any of them and don't forget if you've got a question email it to john at info at john Dot au and uh, yeah John's happy to, happy to help out now a quick preview for next week's show guys um, obviously I've got the LinkedIn live with John on Thursday but on Tuesday at 4 p.m I've got a really special guest on to talk about how we're using recycled plastic into roads it's a really big topic um, I'll launch some promos about Tuesday's guest in the next 24 to 48 hours and uh, you guys are going to love this um, our guest next Tuesday is someone uh, who I respect a lot, calls a spade a spade, and uh, is very passionate about the circular economy and making sure that we have end markets for all, all the recycled plastic uh, that is being produced across the world. So that's going to be next Tuesday at 4 p.m. John and I will join you guys next um, 
John and I will join you guys again next Thursday uh, for our third episode, uh, fourth episode, sorry. Um, I think beginning not in, in live thinking here um, is the John Lee series. And, uh, yeah, John, is there anything you want to finish on uh, before we wrap up the show? Yeah, only one thing, really. Uh, if any of this works, any of the things I've been talking about, please let me know and I'll try them myself. <laughs> um, they are, they definitely work, John. I, I know that. There are so many lessons here that I'm um, hearing again. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I really look forward to every episode myself. So I hope you guys have enjoyed them. John and I certainly have, and we'll see you next Thursday. Thank you.